And we're back. Dan Bennett, thank you so much for joining joining me today. Dan, for the folks tuning in, is the real deal. He runs videoforentrepreneurs.com. He's worked with brands like Bud Light. He's worked with Harley Davidson, Nerf, Pantene, the Detroit Lions. Um, and you've transitioned into this business where you really help people who are doing remote content spice up their video and make it as perfect as possible. And that's really what I want to dive into today because the way podcasting is going is becoming so much more visual. It started as an audio only platform, and that's really where the diehard podcasters want it to stay. But the numbers are not reflecting that. It's going into YouTube. You have to be on YouTube now if you want to have a quote unquote successful podcast. So my first question for you is why do you think that video has become such an important aspect for podcasts and just for content creation in general? Good question. Uh, something I preach often, a drum that I beat, is that the most powerful part of storytelling, which is really at the core of all I do, I, I help people capture their own essence, if you will, and um, storytelling comes into play quite often there. And and I think the most important part about storytelling is creating relatability. Um, I don't think it's you know the feeling personally that a podcast has to be visual to be good, right? But it does add this layer. Of relatability i can see your face i can see how you grinned when your your co-host said that joke i get a sense of who you are and yeah video just brings more of that relatability into the picture um and it's something that you know we subconsciously and psychologically enjoy as well we're, we're so saturated with great content now that um i when i hear about a podcast one of the first things i do is see if they film it because i'd rather watch it, then listen to it, of course, unless I'm in the car. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it, we were talking about this on a live stream I was doing yesterday with the podcast Super Friends as a show that I do. And it's such an interesting thing that human beings want to see the talking heads. I mean, the information is all predicated on the audio. That's where you're getting the most of the value. But for us to just want to see everything is such an interesting wrinkle in how we've evolved and how technology has moved forward. And why I want people to get into video is because they can have access to that extra, you know, audience that is on YouTube consuming podcasts. And, you know, not everyone has the multi camera setup, the Joe Rogan producer cutting back and forth between the guests and the speaker. Maybe we're just doing something very simple. Like for me, I'm just using my iPhone webcam, the continuity camera, which we've talked about previously in talks offline. But for the podcaster that's kind of doing this as a hobby, they don't have a ton of budget to spend. Is there like one to two pieces of low hanging fruit that people can take action on right now to improve their video? Yeah, I would definitely say so. Um, I know there's, I think currently at the time of us at least having this conversation, there's a, a pretty big uh, debate on Twitter happening right now between USB microphones and XLR microphones. And it doesn't matter if you know the difference between those or not right now. But I bring it up because I think a piece of low hanging fruit is a good USB microphone, a microphone that you buy that's made for speaking into that just plugs directly into your computer. I use a Samsung Q9U. It's something you can get for like a hundred bucks on Amazon or at your local Best Buy if you have one nearby. And I don't need an audio interface. It's dynamic, so it cuts out a lot of the surrounding sound, like the garbage trucks that love to drive by and the airplanes that fly over when I talk, and plugs right into my computer is ready to go. So I think that's huge. And then if you are using something like you mentioned iPhone continuity camera or a webcam or even your built in camera, a lot of times what you can do is just make sure to get some really great light on you, which can be done inexpensively, and then take care of your surroundings, you know, eliminate distractions or make sure that there's things in your background that are either on brand or part of your personality or let me know a little bit more about you. And uh, an unmade bed makes a terrible background. So sometimes just flip is the that a shot at me? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> is there one? Because I can't see one. No, I've I just positioned it to where hopefully it's covered. It's out of the background. <laughs> That's awesome. No, no, I love it. Like a, a practical light, a jersey. I'm getting a sense of what it might be like to hang out in that room with you, which is what I'm always after. I don't think there's a, a, a look that's particularly better than another, but it's about eliminating distraction for me. So I think those things, just really practically thinking about your framing, getting decent light on your face. And then um, audio is always first for me when I work with clients and students, get a get a decent microphone and get it close to your mouth and don't be afraid to 
you know, have a little microphone discipline and let that thing do its job. Let's get a little bit deeper into the the actual lighting placement. So let's just say we're talking something like a, uh, I'm going to just pull this out of the frame here. Let's just say we're talking about one of these little ring lights here. So in terms of the actual placement of the light, would you recommend having that behind the camera? Would you recommend it having off to the side? I know that a lot of people talk about see, like that little lamp that I have back there, some kind of backlight. If someone just had one USB ring light, where would you recommend they place it? One ring light. Okay. Um, as close to you as possible without being in your shot. does not have to be behind the camera. It could be next to it. It could be slightly in front of it as long as the lens doesn't pick it up. Um, 45 degree angle-ish, right? Sometimes your desk might be in the way or there might be things that you have to go around. Um, slightly higher than your eye line, so it's not blinding you if you happen to glance that way. And if it's a bit too kind of direct and punchy and bright, um, grabbing a simple piece of parchment paper from the kitchen and taping it on there so it folds and just kind of hangs in front of the light and diffuses it and softens it a little bit more before it hits your skin is a great way to tamp down a really bright light if you got a ring light that's really, really glaring. Um, yeah, and I love that. I actually have a video on you know how to use that ring light that's like in the closet that someone bought and never uses. And, <laughs> yeah. uh, some of the stuff I just shared is is in that video as well. Just Is that on your YouTube you channel? Got. Yeah, it's on the old one, but I could definitely give you a link that people could. Yeah, yeah, we'll put that link in the description for people to check out. Cool. Yeah, it's a fun one. I get responses all the time. It's like, I never thought of that. And I'm like, that's because you don't have filmmaking in your background. And that's okay. You know, <laughs> like we were always forced to do whatever we could with the budget we had. So yeah, I, I love a good ring light. I just always tell people don't use it the way it was intended. Don't shoot through it and put that weird ring in your pupil. That's right. Yeah, just that's my personal it, opinion. Yeah, no, that seems to be a lot more for like the uh, kind of the TikTok Instagram model type of look. That's not really what we're going for, especially if you're wearing glasses, too. I see that a ton. That was a big problem yeah. that I've had with some of my clients is if they're wearing glasses and that ring light. I love the idea of the par the wax paper or parchment paper right over because that's something that everyone has in their house or their apartment and that can fix that ring light really quickly. Um, and another thing wrinkle in there too is that when I had you come in and look at one of my studios or one of the studios that I work in, we talked about the difference between the kind of orange light and the white daylight and you recommended it always going with the daylight. So for those of you listening and watching right now if you look at those a lot of these ring lights have different settings so it'll be kind of like an orange light or a white light why would you recommend the white daylight versus the orange one yeah for sure uh i'll preface this with um almost everything in filmmaking and i consider video creation creation to be filmmaking i probably don't say that often with my clients and stuff because i don't want to scare them but we are creating little mini stories you know through video um everything to do with setting up a great shot is subjective so i'll throw that out there you can take everything i say do the opposite and still get a great end result um what i love to share though because when i discovered this years ago and it was taught to me i got so excited about it is that white light which a lot of people call it uh daylight which you would see on something like some light bulb packaging at home depot or something like that generally falls somewhere around 5600 kelvin if you ever look at a light bulb at home depot and it says 5600k that's what it's talking about and what's cool is there's this natural marriage in nature between the sun and our eyeballs. Um, the sun's been the same, at least for the you know history of humanity. And our eyeballs have adapted to be used to that kind of light. And the sun is actually white. You know, we draw orange suns when we're kids on the paper, and we kind of just always think of it that way. But the actual spectrum of light coming from the sun is right around that 5600 Kelvin or daylight. And cameras are made to mimic the human eye. So all the sensor technology, everything they're doing is to try and actually give you a picture off that camera that looks like real life. And then whatever you do creatively to it afterwards is up to you. So if you mix that daylight, which is the sun, and that camera, which is the you know digital version of the human eyeball, that really gives you a great starting point of what looks natural. Your skin tones, the, the color of the wall behind you, all the things, you, you get a good baseline of what's normal or what's natural. Going from there, say you're a super pale person, you're not super close to the wall that's behind you, and you're like, I look kind of washed out. Start to dial that ring light over towards tungsten, add some yeah, orange into your face, and then all of a sudden you're looking more natural. So there's always room to play, but I love to start there because it's a really natural look. And what's really cool too is when I start working with clients and they say, should I start a video first? One of the, I've kind of reworked this sort of pitch 
recently with the rise of YouTube and the video component of podcasting. But normally what I say is we need to nail down the audio side first, which you mentioned earlier, the audio is, is critical in having good content in general, regardless of whether it's video or not. And I don't want to put too much pressure on that person's plate because it's one thing to now start having to become a host of a podcast and have to learn how to have a conversation with people, especially if it's your first time meeting them. Now we're adding the camera component and now there's a bunch of lights on us. We have to worry about what you're wearing and how you look and where your framing is. On top of all of that, you have to get comfortable talking on camera and being comfortable on camera. And I think a great thing that you offer is not only the whole setup making you look great, but you actually help people become more comfortable on camera. Do you have any kind of tips for new new podcasters or people who are just getting into the video side of things? Quick tips on how they can become more comfortable on camera. Yeah, you know what's uh, super fresh uh, for me right now? I just kicked off uh, our cohort Video Content Pros and it runs four or five times a year. And the entire premise of the cohort is to get really good on camera. And a lot of people think that means the best gear, the best light, the best mic. That's a small part of it. The rest is actually preparation, presentation, camera presence, your actual production and distribution and having those things in line to make your job easier on you. All those components come into play. Um, and then I, I call it my wince face. Like I always make this face and scrunch up a little and go, oh, the only part I can't do for you, even if you pay me a million dollars, is get the reps in for you. And that's really where the the comfortability comes in. So um, even though I tell everyone in my cohort, I'm going to trick you into telling great story, whether you realize it or not, most of the time, even though I divulge that information, they're still surprised <laughs> when it happens, right? So we just gave out homework on Monday of this week um, when the cohort kicked off. And one of the videos that I have people make, super simple, you don't even have to use your full setup, you could just use a smartphone, whatever. I just want you to tell me, um, no script, no no rules, what's your favorite food? Either the genre or the restaurant or the person that made that food for you when you were a kid or whatever the case may be. I just want you to tell me your favorite food and why that's the case. And the video is already coming in this week for homework and I just watched a couple this morning. And you get the most authentic, just unfiltered versions of people they sometimes they close their eyes as they reminisce about their mom's spaghetti um, one of my current students is from spain and has been in the states a long time and he's talking about his mom's spaghetti and like how much he loved it growing up and all this stuff and how he misses it but she's coming in two weeks to visit and he's like she actually has a task list and on that list is you better make your spaghetti while you're here <laughs> And this video, I'm laughing at this video, I'm feeling touched. And the magic of the whole thing is that there wasn't a script, there wasn't intention, there wasn't an agenda, it was just a story. And you really get to see quickly how powerful that can be when you watch it back and you're like, oh, I see what you're saying, Dan. That's not that that bad, right? Like I was just kind of talking and telling a story. So you have on one end, the production, which I think you should take serious, doesn't have to be perfect, you get better over time, all those things. People like you and I help people do that to make it even easier on them. And then the part where you can just go, even if it's scripted, you're just doing your thing, it's coming from the heart, you're you're used to it, you're getting better with time. And find the blend somewhere. I call it like a cocktail, right? Like part vodka, part orange juice, there's your screwdriver. Not everyone's going to love half vodka, half orange juice. They might want a little less vodka, who knows? But you have to kind of start making that. Find your mix and then really lean into getting better. And I often say it's kind of like riding a bike. Um, you're going to fall down, skin your knees. It's going to hurt, but you're going to learn. And then when you get that first time where no one's holding your seat, man, that's that's life changing. And then you'll have that skill set for the rest of your life. So I think becoming comfortable on camera is kind of a forgiveness that we have to give ourselves as we get good at something just like anything else. So hopefully that's helpful. No, it does. And it really drives home the point that I hit all the time on this podcast and other places that I'm putting out content is that the reps are is really the only way to do it. No one is born a great broadcaster except for the top 1% of the people that are doing it for the NBA, the MLB, the NFL. Those guys are, were born to do that. But you can learn this skill and the best way to do it is similar to learning any other skill. Guitar, riding a bike, like you said, it's just practice, practice, practice. Um, one thing that we did talk about when you came to the studio that I thought was a really cool service that you offer is the sandbox where you allow people to have user. You're sort of building this community where people can pay sort of like a really low cost monthly subscription to get tons of different feedback on the videos that they're creating. And one of the places that I think people get so nervous about is they think the first time that they sit down and record is go, holy shit, I have to now like 
be really good at this because this is going out next week. This is going to, this is going to be published for everybody to see. And I'm not great at this yet. What you offer in this sandbox uh, service. And I want, I want you to touch more on that is you're letting people record things first before it goes live and get that feedback first. Hey, your lighting's a little bit off. Hey, you're not really looking at the camera a ton. You're seeming to fidget around a lot in your seat. You're speaking really quickly. Can you talk a little bit more about this sandbox thing, how you came up with it and sort of the results you're seeing? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, you know what? It ties directly to, um, podcasting. So it's kind of cool. Um, I, I have a podcast that's kind of just going to float out there in the universe, um, and eventually disappear where I did a hundred episodes, uh, interviewing entrepreneurs and all kinds of stuff. And as I was building that and then building video for entrepreneurs, my brand, I'm like, I want to be on more podcasts and host less podcasts. And as I was kind of doing that, I actually had three podcasts that I was on in one week. It was a really exciting week. I almost felt like back in my band days when we used to tour and we could stop at radio stations and tell our story, you know, and I was like, oh, I'm on this show. I'm on that show. And um, this is no exaggeration. Every one of those podcasts I was on, the question ended up coming up. Hey, man, when you're talking about people hate their voice or they're, they don't know what to say once they got the gear and all that kind of stuff, and maybe they're afraid. Um, how do you help? And I'm like, well, you know, it's one to one, but I want to offer something that uh, helps people, even if I'm not there, or I can only be there sometimes. And then I'm on the second show, and the same question comes up again. I'm like, well, you know, I've, I've been really thinking about like I want to help people with some kind of service so they can actually get better over time. And then the third time, and I knew that podcast wasn't going to come out for another 30 days or so. I said, you know what? I built something. And I'll give you the link to it. You guys can check it out. And it's made exactly for this purpose. And then I went and built the sandbox. <laughs> I'm like, I have to do this because it's coming up everywhere. So it was really kind of a solution to a problem I was hearing quite often from podcast hosts who talk to a lot of people who do video. And, you know, it's it's one of those things I like to keep it real. Um, I have a big heart, an open mind. I'm empathetic, but I I shoot people straight and I don't pull any punches. So, you know, part of that is like, hey, you can come here and get loving critique and feedback. Um, and I'm also going to tell you, if you ask your mom or your coworker or your friend, how's this video? They're going to be like, oh, it's, it's not bad. Like, good job. And that's not going to help you here. We're going to say exactly what you just said. The light is reflecting in your glasses in a weird way. We can fix that. Um, you seemed kind of stiff. Maybe next time add a little bit of energy. Let's see how that looks and then come back and try it again. And all those things are happening in a critical yet loving and safe environment. And I think that's where kind of the magic is. And from there on out, you know, it's just sharing with people stories. Like I've interviewed um, a, a lot of Fortune 1000 and even Fortune 100 company CEOs where I bring all the equipment. I got all the questions. They're just the subject matter expert. And I've watched them crumble and melt in front of the camera. So the best and biggest and brightest also struggle with, you know, putting stuff out there and worrying about what they're saying and how it's going to be perceived, uh, which is why I called it the sandbox. Come play, experiment, see what happens when you try certain things. And then when you're ready to, you know, enter that uh, beach sand carving competition where you make your giant sandcastle, you'll be good to go. So that's what we're after. And we'll link that as well. I think that's just a phenomenal service and something that I want to steal and do for audio Don't because it. yes, I, because please. it's it's such a cool concept to let creators come together and provide that feedback before you take that jump in. Because one of the things with podcasts is, but that people kind of just have to deal with is like the first few episodes are going to stink. That's just from an audio perspective. There's just things that you improve on your cadence, everything, your interviewing style. If you can avoid some of those hiccups before you actually jump into the water or, you know, start the sandcastle competition, that's just going to make the whole catalog of content you're putting together so much better in the long run. Let's cap this conversation with things to avoid because we can tell people all the right things to do, but we can also help them avoid some things that are pretty common that people do that get screwed up in the beginning. So are there any mistakes that people make early on that you see common across all video content creators? Um, one big one that a lot of these end up being like mindset and theoretical, right? Cause like I have a product called three hour studio where I, where I help people get all the right gear and get it set up and looking and sounding great. And then often we end up at a spot where they're like, awesome. What do I say? What do I do now? Right? So a lot of these things are the mindset that happens after you're kind of chugging along, whether it's a podcast or creating video or whatever. Um, one of the first things that really comes to mind when you're talking about what, where I think people kind of like mess up is um taking themselves too serious like you can be a subject matter expert you can know your shit inside and out you can be really impressive 
And like me, you can tell dumb dad jokes in your videos to make yourself giggle. Like that's okay, right? Um, little little throws to like memes and short little clips from movies that kind of correlate with what I've just said, like a teleprompter thing and then showing Ron Burgundy for half a second in my video. All those things for me are for me, right? Like they make me laugh. It's my personality. I love a good dad joke, a good pun. Um, it's not to necessarily entertain people, but they end up getting a really authentic dose of me. So if they see some of my videos and then get on camera with me on a call, they're like, oh, you're actually that way. That's refreshing, right? So taking yourself too serious is a huge mistake. Um, now, like I said earlier, I think it's a cocktail. And there's some people out there that have bigger channels. They'll remain nameless, but their their whole approach is just make 100 videos, make them terrible, you'll eventually get better. I hate that because I don't think it's got to be that way because there's people like me and you out there who can help you not suck when you first get started. Yes, you won't be your best because there's a natural rhythm, like you said, that comes with time. But I don't think you have to put out a bunch of garbage till you get better. I just don't think that's the way it has to be. So like um, feeling like you have to be perfect, I think actually makes you make worse video because you're like trying to script and memorize, which is a terrible idea, especially on content video. Um, you're trying to wear a polo shirt when you normally wear hoodies because you're worried what someone's going to think when your real personality is hoodies. I'm throwing myself under the bus here. Like all those things kind of come into play where it's like, I, it doesn't have to be that serious. Yes, we all know it's not a joke. You're making content about your business or your service or your product that matters to you. But I also don't think it has to try to be something that it's not. So taking yourself too serious, trying to make it perfect instead of easing into that cocktail. And I think the last thing is like something that I'm so glad my brain doesn't do. I'm very lucky in this regard, but a lot of filmmakers I know and a lot of people that create content and do it well um, get caught up in What's the latest gear? What's the rabbit hole? What's the shiny new, you know, um, someone I, I will bag on. And if you need to cut this out, that's OK, is Descript. They position themselves as a video editor. I don't think it's a great video editor. They're great for audio. And all these people who just want a quick shortcut are like, I'm going to use Descript to, you know, edit my videos or to make my subtitles look like all the other TikTok videos. And I think that takes away from what your video could actually be if you're staying true to yourself. Nothing wrong with subtitles, nothing wrong with TikTok. But when people chase those kind of trends and rabbit holes and gear and what's hot and shiny, um, we all know what that does. It takes us away from our mission, which is something that could be, like you said earlier, as simple as a talking head and just getting to know someone through seeing their face on camera. So those are probably my top three. No, I'm not cutting that out because I'm all for dunking on these platforms because you can't you can't be married to one platform like that. And if you don't, if you're not realistic about the shortcomings and liabilities of of those platforms, then how are they going to improve? Maybe someone listens from Descript listens to this at some point and they go, hey, this really smart video guy thinks our tool is shit. So we should probably try and fix yeah. that a little bit better. So for those of you out there using Descript for video editing, take that into consideration. Um, Dan, this has been huge. I really, really appreciate you joining me today. Where can people learn more about you online? Where can they follow you and uh, talk just a general about the services that you offer? I know you've covered it lightly. Yeah, for sure. Um, Videoforentrepreneurs.com. Uh, just trying to make it as easy as possible for people to know what I do. Uh, the YouTube channel, um, everyone's using the at sign now because we got our tag. So that's really cool. So if you just go to youtube.com forward slash at video for entrepreneurs, you'll find me there. Um, same, uh, same tag on, uh, LinkedIn, which I like to be at, um, do a lot of my business and just kind of networking and stuff there. So if you can remember video for entrepreneurs, you should be able to track me down and, uh, everything I'm trying to do hits one of the major components of getting good at video. So there's the gear. So I have three hourstudio.com, which is the number three. And that's very one to one. We help you get all the right gear. I build you a list. You order from that list, drop ship it, set it up, do some uh, homework. I throw some hot sauce edits on that homework so you can see what's possible with your video content and then you're good to go. So it's kind of like learning how to ride a bike and eventually I take my hand off the seat. Um, beyond that is the cohort. Like I said, we just launched one. The next one, I believe, um, is in May, the beginning of May. Not a solid date yet, but um, that's a four week in person live um, cohort that's held inside my community. So you get all the goodies of the community and the asynchronous learning and communication while we meet a couple times a week live. And then one to one work um, is always something that people are interested in if they're CEO of a small company or they just want to move fast or actually some of my favorite clients have been uh, people who already have podcasts and have been doing it a while and are adding video to the mix. 
And what's cool about what you mentioned earlier is sometimes it's like audio first, we'll worry about video second. That is 1000% correct. But the cool part is once you go through that process of learning a new technical learning curve, like uh, podcasting, adding video is actually not that bad because you're already used to what it takes to record something, edit something and publish something. Um, so the one to one work sometimes is just someone who wants to move really fast or just wants a block of editing hours so that my team can edit for them on a regular basis or um, introducing video into, you know, their content marketing or their current kind of situation because they're ready to add video. And uh, yeah, emails dan at videoforentrepreneurs.com and all of those uh, sales pages that you might run across all have a free strategy call button at the top. And that's my bread and butter. I help people get over sticky situations real, real quick. And then if they ever need more help, I'm there for them. Uh, but no sales, no pressure, no gimmicks, just strategy. And that's fun because I get to help people every week. You heard it from the man himself. Check out videoforentrepreneurs.com. Dan, thanks again for joining me. Everyone listening and watching, I appreciate you tuning in. Follow the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, subscribe on YouTube. Links to everything that we discussed in this conversation are linked below. And I'll see you next week.